We are delighted to welcome back the wonderful uh, Catherine Poissarat, um, who obviously gave us a talk during lockdown on the Gil Matsuri. Uh, this evening, she'll be giving us a, an insight into a different, another aspect of Kyoto. Uh, this time, we'll be focusing on the dragons of the Gion Matsuri. Um, so for those of you who are perhaps joining us for the first time and maybe aren't uh, quite so familiar uh, with Catherine and her work, uh, Catherine was a resident uh, of Kyoto for uh, 20 years, uh, living and working there. She is the author of the book, uh, The Gion Festival, Exploring Its Mysteries. Uh, she's also the creator of both uh, the gionfestival.org website and planetdharma.com, so you can check those out uh, after the lecture. Please uh, you know, go online and, and have a look at those uh, wonderful websites. Uh, currently, she is a teacher of meditation and Buddhist philosophy at the Clear Sky Retreat Center in British Columbia, where she's joining us from. So uh, without further ado, Catherine, uh, it's over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Samuel. Uh, thank you to everyone for coming or, or for watching. We'll be making a video available. And um, thanks very much to Angela and, and Samuel and Alex from Japan Society Northwest. And thanks also to the JET Alumni Association. And it's really been a pleasure to work with you at JSNW. It's a lovely organization. Um, I'd also like to thank my wonderful team here at Clear Sky, who's helped me set this up on this end. And um, the head priest at Yasaka Shrine, Nomura-san, my friend Nakamura Masashi, and Jan Williams, who have really helped spark some great ideas about dragons in the Gion Matsuri for this, that shaped this presentation. And uh, most of all, I'd really like to thank the community of, of people who put on the Gion Matsuri in Kyoto every year. It's a very wonderful community of, of people, and I feel privileged to have been able to get to know so many of them. So let's jump in. Um, when you think about the Gion Matsuri, uh, this is probably what you think about. This is probably the most famous feature of the Gion Matsuri, the Yamaboko floats. And this is the procession on July 17th. It's quite a spectacular feature of the festival. But if you spend a lot of time or any time at all at the Gion Matsuri, you notice that there are a lot of dragons all around the Gion Matsuri. This is a textile that adorns the float. Here's a blue dragon, a lot of dragon metalwork, for example, another blue dragon textile that adorns an Ogyojo Yama float. So why dragons? Why so many dragons? I, I got curious about this and started investigating. So we need to back up a little bit. And this is uh, the front gate for Yasaka Jinja, Yasaka, Yasaka Shrine in Kyoto. It's a famous landmark at the end of Shijo Street. And it's considered maybe the supreme Shinto shrine in Japan. Shinto, as most of you probably know, is the indigenous uh, religion or spiritual practice in Japan. It's a nature-based animistic uh, practice, which is basically a form of shamanism. And Yasaka Shrine was founded in the year 656. So it predates Kyoto as the capital. It became the capital in 794. Now the deities, the main deities at Yasaka Shrine are important in this story. And so the the central deity is Susano no Mikoto. That's the younger brother of Amaterasu, the sun goddess, and he's significantly the god of storms. So here's a picture of a, a storm happening in during the Gion Matsuri, and it takes place every summer during the rainy season, the annual rainy season from June to, to July. And so sometimes it takes place in a downpour like this, even in typhoons. And Kyoto, this is Shirakawa. Kyoto is a city of water. There are rivers and, and streams throughout the city. So whether or not there are storms is, is really a significant event for the people of Kyoto and most of Japan. So here's a woodblock print of Susano no Mikoto there in the middle, the god of storms. And he is rescuing his partner, Kushinada, Kushi Inada Hime. That means comb rice grain princess. She's on the right there. 
And she was kidnapped by this eight-headed dragon on the left, Yamata no Orochi. She was kidnapped and held prisoner, and Susano no Mikoto, god of storms, went and rescued her, and then they became partners. And, and so he had to defeat this dragon. And this was the first... We could say this is the first dragon at the heart of the of the Gion Festival because this story about Yamato no Orochi and Susano no Mikoto proving himself and then getting together with Kushi Nada Hime is very central to this story. Kushi Nada Kushi Inada Hime is considered the soul of rice. I asked the head priest at Yasaka Shrine if she was the goddess of rice, and he said she's the soul of rice. So I was very impressed by that. So the deities now at the Yasaka Shrine then are Susano no Mikoto, the god of shrines, Kushi Inada Hime, the soul of rice, and their children, considered three deities. Now, Susano no Mikoto is conflated or put together with another deity called Gozu Tenno. That means ox-headed deity, and that's what this, um, that's what this scroll says. It says, Gion Gozu Tenno. And we see scrolls like this all around the Gion Festival. There are very few visual depictions of the ox-headed de deity, mostly just the scrolls. But here's one rare one. You can see on top of the, the front red head is, is an ox head. And this is from the Hashibenke Yama collection. So the ox-headed deity is a protector deity, and he's sometimes called the Lord of Death, but as a protector deity, he guards this threshold between this world and the next world, between life and death. And that's really significant because the Gion Festival has a lot to do with life and death, as, as we'll talk about here in a moment. So here are the three Mikoshi or portable shrines at Yasaka Shrine, and these are go through the streets, are carried through the streets of central Kyoto uh, during the Gion Matsuri, and there is one for each of the deities, one for Susano no Mikoto, the god of storms, one for his partner, Kushi Inada Hime, the soul of rice, and one for their children. So during the Gion festival, these are carried through the streets of Kyoto, and this is, they're purifying the streets. They're bringing their... Uh, protective and life-nourishing energies to the streets of Kyoto. They, they rest in the central Kyoto for a week, and then the, the Gion Festival happens. There's a before part and an after part. Um, and this is the central event that the whole Gion Festival revolves around, is these Mikoshi coming into town to purify the streets and then returning back to Yasaka Shrine. Now, Let's back up a little bit and go, let's talk about the founding of, of Kyoto. This is a model at the Kyoto city, um, Hakubutsukan at the um, Bumpaku, the cultural museum in Kyoto. And this is a map of Heian Kyo. When Kyoto was first founded, it was modeled on the city of Xi'an in China and very much according to Feng Shui or what's called in English geomancy, where you can see all the streets run north, south, east, west, and the directions are very important. Now, one of the practically speaking, one of the wonderful things about this is you can never get lost in Kyoto, which is something I, I really love as a resident. <laughs> So why does this matter for the Gion Festival? Well, Yasaka Shrine is in the east of Kyoto, the very eastern part of Kyoto. And in Feng Shui, each direction has an animal. And the blue dragon rules the east. And the blue dragon is also related to the element of water. So again, we're tying back to the storms and this, this notion of water and um, the life-giving quality of water that makes rice possible, it makes survival possible for the Japanese people. So this is the main hall of Yasaka Shrine. And so a neat thing about the blue dragon is that it's believed to live beneath the main hall. And there's a passageway down deep, deep, deep into the ground into a kind of cave-like place where there is a pond under this main hall. And it's believed that the blue dragon 
lives in this pond, which, which I find fascinating. And I heard many years ago that sometime in the maybe the early 70s or so, they put concrete over the pond because they, they thought it was dangerous. And um, I met the new head priest of Yasaka Shrine this past summer, and I asked him, is it, is it really true that there's concrete over that pond? And he said, he said, yes, there is, and I would like to remove it. And I was so excited to hear that because when you think of the flow of energy, well, you don't want your dragon kind of suppressed by a concrete lid, right? The, the energy is not going to flow properly. And... Um, so here, here we were meeting. I presented my book to the um, head priest at, at Yasaka Shrine, and this is when he told me this. Now, he also got talking about the waters. When the, the floats turn corners in the Gion Festival, the water is, is thrown underneath their wheels to help them turn. And um, he said that the water is going to be mixed between water taken from Yasaka Shrine and water taken from another pond called Shinsen-en. So let's talk about Shinsen-en. He got, he got very excited about this, and he started talking about Shinsen-en and the dragons at Shinsen-en and Kukai, who you might know as Kobo Daishi, the great saint of Japanese Buddhism, of Shingon Buddhism. And, and he was talking about Kukai and the dragons, and I couldn't quite follow the conversation, but he got so excited about it that I was inspired to follow it up. So this is Shinsen-en. This is a, a lake, and it's on Oike. Oike means honorable lake, and this is the lake that they're talking about. So this lake actually dates back to the founding of Kyoto, and uh, it used to be about 10 times as big, but it's, it's the lake from that original imperial palace way back in the uh, seven, seventh century, eighth century. And um, this pond is, this lake is still there. Now, it used to be a pleasure pond from the Imperial Palace. But let's get back to talking about Kukai. So in the year 824, the emperor ordered, there was a terrible drought, and the emperor ordered Kukai and another very powerful monk named Jimbu to, sorry, Jubin, to bring rain because everybody was suffering terribly from this drought. And so these were very high level practicing Buddhist monks. And so they set to it trying to bring rain. And it turned into a kind of rain making competition. Who could get rain first, Kukai or Jubin? Now, Kukai tried and tried, but he couldn't bring rain. So what was he doing to try to bring rain? Well, interestingly enough, he called dragons. And um, this was the first, what, what came to be known as the Rain Prayer Sutra ritual. It was the first one that Kukai ever did, and it became a tradition that carried on for over the next 400 years. So he called the dragons to bring rain because they rule, the blue dragon rules water. And, and dragons in general are associated with the element of water. So here's a beautiful dragon folding screen or byobu in, in the Gion Festival Byobu Matsuri when people put their um, personal treasures on display for the public. And here's a close-up of that dragon. So they're, they're calling rain, so dragons are often depicted with clouds and with lightning because that comes together with rain as well. Okay, so how do they cause rain? Well, they cause rain through a jewel. And if you look closely at images of dragons up there in the right, upper right-hand corner, for example, the dragons are often seen together with a jewel. Here's a jewel on the upper left. This, these are all dragons from the Gion Festival. This is Hoka Boko. That's Ofune Boko, dragon holding a jewel. And here is a dragon ho holding a jewel, and this woman in front of the dragon is also holding a jewel. Now, in Buddhism, the, the jewel, uh, there's something called the wish-fulfilling jewel. Um, sometimes it's also called the pearl without price. So Kukai tried and tried, 
but the dragons didn't come. So why not? He Kukai meditated upon it, and he found that his competitor, Jubin, had trapped all of the dragons because he was jealous of Kukai and preventing them from responding to Kukai's summons. However, one escaped, one dragon escaped and came to Kukai and brought rain. And it rained throughout the country and, and people were saved. The rice grew. And this is the dragon that came in this picture. Um, this is from the Ishikawa Nanao Museum, this image. So this is a dragon known as Zenyo. And uh, Zen means a uh, good or fortuitous, and Yo means woman, and she's called Zen Yo Ryuo. Ryuo means dragon king, so it's like good woman, dragon king. So woman, dragon king, this is kind of strange. So what is it, how can you be a woman and a king at the same time? Well, there's a very famous sutra called the Lotus Sutra in Buddhism, and one of the main features or the main people featuring in the Lotus Sutra is someone called the dragon's, Dragon King's Daughter. And she was a young girl dragon or young woman dragon. And um, Manjushri, the Bodhisattva of wisdom, praised her for her wisdom and her compassion and her um, understanding of the sutras and her enlightenment. And one of the Buddhist disciples said, what? That's impossible because, and, and she was there, he said, you can't get enlightened in a woman's body. And this was a very common thought for many centuries in Asia, that it was impossible to get enlightened in a woman's body. And that if a woman wanted to get enlightened, she would pray and pray and pray to be reborn as a male, and then she could get enlightened. Well, when the Dragon King's daughter heard this from one of the Buddha's disciples, she instantly changed her shape and became a man and then became known as a dragon king and a, and a protector of Buddhism. So this is my personal theory that that's why this dragon is called in Japanese woman dragon king. Uh, it, it bears further research and um, I look forward to looking into this more. So as the, uh, for many centuries, this was the only female known to have gotten enlightened. So she was a really great inspiration to many women practitioners and Buddhist nuns for many centuries as a role model. And so today, it's believed that she lives in the lake at Shinsen-en. And uh, so why is this significant for the Gion Festival? Well... Shinsen En is also where the Gion Festival began. So let's go to that. Let's go to the roots of the Gion Festival. The, what we know as the Gion Festival started in the year 869. And in those years, there was, on average, an epidemic every third year. Now, the, this is an old woodblock print, and, and that um, smoke there with the spirits in it is, is believed the epidemic. These are people tending to a sick man. And it was believed in those days that epidemics were caused by angry spirits or vengeful spirits. So there was an epidemic every three years, so they believed that some spirits were really angry. Now, of course, today we know that epidemics are caused by, by germs. And in those days, well, there's still something in Kyoto that called the summer sickness, and that's related to the rainy season. It would rain a lot, there would be standing water, and then uh, there would be things like um, cholera or dysentery that, that would go around. So now remember, the main deity in the Gion Festival is Susano no Mikoto, the god of storms. Okay, and it said that in the year 869, there was a terrible epidemic, so bad that the, like the rivers were filled with corpses. So in 869, they had a, a gathering. The emperor called for a great ritual at Shinsen-en to appease these angry spirits and um, ask them to stop being angry and, and take away the epidemic. So we can only guess that it worked because they kept doing the Gion Festival. If there was another epidemic, they called the same kind of ritual. And by the year 1000, it became an annual event and the Gion became the Gion Matsuri that we know today. Now, if, if we don't have epidemics, as we know, that's, that's a good thing. But 
hopefully that means that everything is fine. But then there's the opposite problem, which is if there is not a surplus of rain, maybe there's a deficit of rain and maybe there's drought. And so then remember that the soul of rice, Kushi Inada Hime, Princess Kushi Inada, is also one of the main Gion festival deities at Yasaka Shrine and for the Gion festival. So, th- so with rainy season, we can have too much water, we can have floods and illness, or we can have not enough water, which leads to droughts, which leads to not enough rice, because rice grows in water, and, and famine. Right. So so this is a very interesting thing to look at now in the 2020s when we're living in an era with with significant climate change. So this is all this story about what happened in the ninth century. But but actually, it's it's kind of relevant for our world today as well. So human relationships with dragons has been used for at least a millennia to try to find a balance between too much rain and not enough rain. And by the way, that 1200 year anniversary of Kukai's rainmaking ritual is in 2024, which that'll, that'll be interesting to see how they do that. Okay, so we talked about in my, um, when I was first sharing about this talk, I talked about elements, the element of rain and water and enlightenment. So Zen, Zen Yoduo, the, the woman dragon king got enlightened. So, so that's one relationship with enlightenment. And there's uh, more to that. This is Koi Yama, Koi means carp. And you can see the figure of the Koi there in the background in the center. And um, you can see it's in water and it's kind of going up and there's an ancient Chinese tale about a carp that swam up a waterfall and when it got to the top of the waterfall it became a dragon and uh, this is a great story and it's very widespread in Japanese culture one of the reasons that carp or koi are so popular in Japanese culture and this is a painting by a famous artist Kimura Hideki that, that they put out during the Gion Festival of Koi. And uh, you can see there's a little bit of writing in the lower right. I'm gonna zoom into that. So he says, carp is dragon in heaven, which is a kind of nice way to talk about in English this, this going up the waterfall and then becoming a dragon. So from a folklore kind of perspective, this relates to prevailing against the odds, which we can all relate to. It's a very human um, experience. And now more esoterically, this also relates to the experience of enlightenment because it's said that that energy is released from the base of our spine and travels up our spine, up to our crown chakra. This is kind of a chakra experience and sort of flowers there. If you're familiar with yoga, you may have seen images of a lotus at the crown of a, of a person's head. And um, so this kundalini rising or energy rising experience is, is one of the hallmarks of the enlightenment experience. So that's a more esoteric meaning of this carp becoming a dragon legend. And interestingly, at Koyama, they have a, a kind of tagline there, which is called Dragon's Gate. And um, I thought, why, why gate? Where does that come from? And I kind of looked into it a little bit. And interestingly enough, there's a Dragon's Gate in China, an actual place that's a Dragon's Gate, where there's a waterfall and there's a, a kind of hole in the rock, which is if, if you were the carp, you would go up the waterfall and kind of fly through that big hole. And... Um, it's the, it's the location where a, a very important school of Taoist philosophy and practice was founded called Dragon's Gate Taoism. And, um, and so that's probably where that, that notion of the Dragon's Gate uh, being a symbol for enlightenment came from. And I wrote about this more in my book. Here's a close up of at Koyama, the carp that's swimming up the waterfall. Okay, let's talk about another dragon in the Gion Festival. So one of the most popular floats 
at the Gion Festival is this one. It's called Fune Boko. That means the shape float. And it's called the, uh, sorry, ship float. It's a ship shape. <laughs> and uh, it's called the Fune ship float for obvious reasons. It's in the shape of a ship. And it's one of two floats in the festival with this unique shape and um, makes it very popular. It's, it's very charming. So the, there's a story behind the ship. Why a ship? Well, in the 500s, so this is before recorded history in Japan. In the, in the 500s, there was an empress. They, they call her Empress, Empress Jingu. But uh, she, in those early days, she was probably more like a tribal leader, like a head of a small clan. So Empress Jingu... Um, did a divination and according to the divination the divination she believed told her to go to the sila kingdom which is present day korea south korea and uh, so she got in a boat and she went across to the sila kingdom to the korean peninsula now this was a very hazardous journey in those days and the ship that she had was probably not as grand as this one it was probably more like a a small boat but um, so she needed help. And, and interestingly, the legend goes that she was helped by this. Uh, oh, and here's this is Empress Jingu revered. This is her statue revered at the Fune Boko meeting place. She receives support from this is the Dragon King or some, sometimes called Dragon King, sometimes called Dragon God. This is also at Fune Boko where where he's revered. So note this, he's holding this tray with two jewels. And you can see behind the guy standing with the towel on his head is, is the dragon king or the dragon god. You can see his red hair there. So he's right at the prow of the Fune Boko guiding Empress Jingu. Empress Jingu is further back. So the dragon king is guiding her where to go. So why is he doing this? Well, partly because he's got these jewels. Remember these jewels? So these jewels are considered, well, they're um, life bringing, they bring rain. They're considered synonymous with relics of the Buddha. They're, so they're considered synonymous with enlightenment in, in Buddhist thought. And in the story of em Empress Jingu, which of course predates Buddhism, it, in this story, the jewels were said to control the tides. And so it allowed Empress Jingu, the assistance from the dragon king or the dragon god, allowed her to travel safely and allowed her to land safely in the Sela kingdom. And supposedly her trip was a great success. And um, she came back with tribute. And so in the second part of the Gion festival, oh, and, and this is, the Fune Boko has a lot of dragons associated with this is a textile on the side of the of the Fune Boko float. This is a beautiful mother pearl dragon again amidst water. That's the rudder of the ship on the back of the ship. This is on the a beautiful textile on the front of the ship. So a lot about dragons. When she came back from the Sila Kingdom, she came back in the second boat-shaped float in the Gion Festival is in the second half of the Gion Festival. It's called O Fune Boko, the great ship float. It's bigger than the Fune Boko. Why is it bigger? Because she came back with lots of tribute, with lots of treasure. And here's the dragon at the front of the boat guiding her back, this beautiful uh, gold leaf dragon sculpture. Okay, so let's talk about, there's more dragons. Let's talk about more. Here's, here's a close-up of the dragon at the prow of the Ofone Boko. Okay, so as I said, there's a lot of different dragons shown throughout the Gion Festival. So there's wooden sculpture like this one. There's um, statues like the Duo or Ryujin, the god, uh, the dragon god or dragon king. Um, there's also a lot of really beautiful textiles depicting dragons. So we, we saw a few here. This is a, 
a modern recreation, a modern replica of an older original. This, this is an original, but, but not that old. It's maybe only 150 or 200 years old. This is a much older original. This is also at Funeboko. Now you can see here that there are some seams on this. So this would have originally hung on the Funeboko during the July 17 procession when it goes through the city streets. And they don't hang this one anymore. Uh, they, for conservation purposes, you can see it's experienced some wear and tear and it's several centuries old. So the, the mood of the era has turned much more towards conservation. And this is really in thanks to the work by Nobuko Kajitani, who used to be the head of textile conservation at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. She's now retired. And Yoshido, Yoshida Kojira-san, who is very involved in the Gion Festival, and they wrote a book together on the non-Japanese textiles collect collection in the Gion Matsuri, and it's a very unique and amazing collection from many countries around the world, very well known in the international textile community. So you can see that there are some seams on this textile. So what's up with the seams? Well, these were actually imperial court robes that got repurposed, taken apart, and re-sewn to, to form these, what are called juton or textiles, that decorated the exteriors of these Gion Festival floats. So interestingly, and, and there are a, a good number of these ancient imperial textiles. Here's one, this is Adare Tenjin Yama. You can see on the side there, there's a dragon textile, and here's a little more close up. This, this main dragon with indeed five claws. So that's pertaining to the Chinese emperor. And there's a good number of these textiles in the Gion Matsuri. So why is that? Well, interestingly, when the dynasty changed in China, the new dynasty didn't really want these old imperial robes that belonged to the previous dynasty because it, it spoke of their power and they wanted to replace it with, with their own power. So they would sell off all of these goods. This was a time when Japan was closed. It was the Sakoku Jidai. It was closed to external uh, trading for the most part, except for Dejima, the Dutch in Dejima in the south. And the Ainu in the north, the Ainu were really excellent traders. And because of the closeness with the continent and the Sakhalin Islands, the Ainu could also get goods in from China and would bring them and they would find their way down to the Giamatsuri, which um, speaks to the skill of the Ainu who were outstanding traders. And it also speaks to the power of the Gion Festival community at that time that they could procure these rare and kind of black market goods that used to belong to the imperial family in China. So this is a modern replica of, of one much older, and this is a, um, there's the, this is a ongoing conversation. You know, this is, doesn't look so pretty, but it's very old and, and very valuable. And this one is much brighter and um, n not as well crafted because uh, the textile traditions back then were, were just phenomenal. This is Hashi Benke Yama, and, and again, we can see some of the seams, how it, this may have been taken apart and put together. And you can sort of see on the left and right side, there's a white, whitish part. That would have been where the sleeves were. And they kind of maybe filled it in with some other um, textiles to make it a perfect square. Here's another ancient Chinese textile, see the dragon, the jewel, the five claws, with, which indicates the emperor. This is at Hachimanyama. So some of these are, are very old and, and very valuable. This is Kuronushiyama, known for its sakura. And then that, that horizontal band across the top is one kind of recycled imperial robe uh, and original. So sometimes they do still decorate with the originals. And then the one below it there on the front is perhaps the oldest 
textile still being exhibited in the Gion Matsuri. It dates to the 1500s and again, an upcycled Chinese robe. So even back then, they were doing really amazing things with upcycling, which is kind of cool. Here's a close-up of that horizontal band, the dragon with the jewel. This, these are some more originals being displayed and the lowest band there again would have been upside you can see the seams they're in kind of um, strips and there with the dragon and some jewels floating in the air did i say in no gyojo yama so sometimes in the procession or when the floats are out on the streets the textiles may look a little bland or a little worn the colors have faded and and sometimes they get a little bit threadbare but if we look close we can see just how well made they are and and just the detail is really astonishing and really so much of the Gyeon festival is about looking closely to look at the details there's lots of um, treasures and, and secrets waiting to be revealed there and notice how many of these dragons are blue. So they refer back to the blue dragon of the east. They refer back to the fact that this Gion Matsuri is taking place in the summer rainy season. And they refer back to this desire for harmony between a, a balance of not too much water and but enough for that life-giving rice that the Japanese people have depended upon for so many millennia. So this is my website. Um, if you'd like to take a screenshot, uh, there's lots of good um, f information that I, I give to you there. And here are some of my social media channels as well. Please um, feel free to stay in touch. You're welcome to stay in touch. And um, please help. If you've enjoyed this, please help spread the word because I'm really my, one of my goals is to support a sustainable Gyeongmatsuri. It's so extraordinary that it's lasted for almost 1,200 years, and I'd really like it to last another 1,200 so future generations can also enjoy it. And I also endeavor to support the wonderful Gion Festival community, so your support helps me to do that, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.